as I said, we have Dr. Greg Tung with us. Um, Dr. Greg Tung is an associate professor in the Colorado School of Public Health's Department of Health Systems Management and Policy. His research interests relate to how scientific evidence is incorporated into policy and program decision making with a special emphasis on inj injury prevention. Uh, Dr. Tung works on a diverse range of injury topics, including the prevention of youth violence, suicides, poisoning, and child abuse. His research interests also include the integration of health services and public health systems. And Greg is a mixed methods researcher and utilizes both quantitative, including longitudinal, multi-level, and time to event analyses, and qualitative methods, uh, especially case studies. Um, so in just a second, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Tung. Um, for everyone who's here with us, we've got over 150 people uh, joining us right now. As Dr. Tung talks, please put your questions, comments in the chat. We hope to have a lively discussion while he's presenting. And we'll save some time at the end for Q&A um, from all of you uh, and get some of Dr. Tung's uh, input on, on your questions. So Greg? Go ahead and take it away. All right, Sarah, thanks for the intro. Uh, and Victoria, I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing so I can start sharing. Let's do that right now, hold on one second. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and while we're getting that dialed in, uh, I'll just say I invite questions uh, at any time. Uh, and Sarah, uh, thanks for helping me moderate. I'm a, I'm a terrible multitasker, so I'm not gonna be able to look at the chats uh, at the same time. Uh, and so I'd, I'll defer to your good judgment about what should what should come in right now uh, versus be held off for later. But I, but I invite questions uh, at any point. Uh, so uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, I'm here to talk about mixed methods frameworks and just explain what they are uh, and talk a little bit about how they can be used and try to demystify them. Um, I got such an, a nice introduction from Sarah, but uh, I'll tell you just a little bit more uh, about myself. Uh, I titled the slide, who am I and how am I qualified? Uh, and as Sarah's mentioned, I'm a I'm faculty in the health systems management and policy department at the School of Public Health. I, um, I'll confess some of my insecurities. I feel like the, the black sheep of the department, but I do identify as a health services researcher uh, and conduct uh, health services research. Um, I have a PhD in public health with a focus on policy related research. I received that uh, from the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, um, where I got lots of training in, in quantitative and qualitative research methods. And maybe most relevant to what I'm going to be talking about, I'm actively engaged uh, in mixed methods research. And you see this lonely bullet point at the bottom of this line, but you know, I'm, I'm still learning. Uh, so I come to this seminar with, with uh, a lot of humility. And uh, uh, I'm going to confess, I've, I've been uh, at the University of Colorado for about 10 years, and I've known about Accords and, and collaborated with people at Accords. As you'll see, I'll talk about some of my research as illustrating examples here. And it, it occurred to me that in this seminar, I'm like, you know, like the world's expert on a particular topic might come and, uh, and rain wisdom down uh, onto you. Uh, so I'm, I'm not quite to that point. So I'm, instead of giving you all the answers, hopefully at the end, we'll uh, collectively in a be in a better position to maybe just a ask better questions. Uh, and so as your questions come in, if you get any, any stumpers for me, I'll, be, I'll try to be uh, open and honest about where I have some clarity and opinions and, and where uh, uh, there's still areas that, that I, uh, I need to learn as well. Uh, and I invite your skepticism for all of this. That's like the natural resting state uh, for researchers, right? Skepticism. So, okay, so that's me. Um, and so let's let's do a little bit of motivation. Let's be thorough. So why mix methods? Uh, I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir, and you guys are sophisticated about this this general topic and the appeal of mix, mix methods. But I'll just say very briefly that you know quantitative and qualitative methods they have their strengths and weaknesses, right? So with quantitative, you um, have relative strengths and causality, the generalizability, and you're able to more specifically uh, measure and estimate the magnitude of effects. And for qualitative methods in general, there's lots of variability. You know, there's there's strengths in terms of its ability to address these high how or why types of questions. And it also has strengths in terms of theory development and, and testing. And really, I think of qualitative methods as 
addressing questions that need measurement for things that are difficult to measure quantitatively, such as human experience or things where there's not readily available uh, quantitative data. And so mixed methods, given those strengths and weaknesses of quantitative versus qualitative methods, mixed methods has a lot of appeal, right? Because you can design a research project, conduct research that in some way leverages the strengths uh, of both you know, general, that big bucket of quantitative research methods and that big bucket uh, of qualitative research methods. And that's a great strength. And then the trade-off there is it can get, it can get complicated. Um, you know, so you already know that I self-identify as a mixed methods researcher. And, and sometimes I'll let people know that I, I love that. Overall, I love that. And the advantage is that I feel like it gives me additional flexibility and more tools to answer research questions. And then the trade-off is, um, and it gives me perspective across a broad range of methods, but the trade-off is it takes lots of work to stay on top of all of those different types of methods. And, and I also find that um, for any given method, there's somebody who specializes in it and, and is stronger than I am. But then also in, in mixing those methods, it can get really complicated, right? You think about the complexity of just mastering one individual quantitative method or one individual qualitative method. And there are people who um, have really great academic careers doing that very type of thing. And then you get into the mixed methods realm and things get, you know, it's, it, it can get really complicated. And that's where um, mixed method framework can, frameworks can help come in and give some clarity and give some structure. Uh, and what they can really do is give clarity about how the methods fit together and how they integrate. Uh, and that's got lots of advantages in terms of writing proposals, actually conducting the research. It gives clarity about how those methods fit together and integrate, and then also writing them up uh, and then communicating them. Um, the one thing I wanna note is we're, we're talking about frameworks and the framework is in kind of an overarching structure in which the methods fit, right? But a framework is not a method. So we'll talk a lot about how the quantitative component integrates with the qualitative component as we walk through these different um, kind of suites of, of frameworks that I've got planned uh, for this seminar, but that's just a framework. The, in, the actual quantitative and qualitative methods that fit into that framework still need to be specified. And so uh, as we go through, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that uh, in detail. Okay, and so I, I wanna give credit where credit is due. I'm gonna be presenting um, kind of a, a, a very flexible, open series of, of frameworks that talk about how uh, quantitative and qualitative methods can be mixed together, but it really all comes from this paper that was published in Health Services Research uh, and authored by uh, Michael Fetters, Leslie Curry, uh, and, and John Creswell. Uh, and in addition to the cover page, I'll just go ahead and put up this uh, table that they've got from this particular paper. And in a nutshell, this basically lays out their kind of overarching mixed methods framework. And it's got different integration levels, specifically three different integration levels. There's uh, integration at the design level, the methods level, uh, and the interpretation and the reporting. And within these levels, there's all these different approaches and we'll walk through them. And I will uh, kind of draw upon my own research to give you illustrated examples of these types of frameworks and how they work. Um, and so that, that is the basic plan for the rest of the seminar, uh, is that I'm going to be kind of demystifying and walking through these different frameworks, these different integration levels, these different approaches, and then interspersing examples from research that I've been uh, involved in myself. Uh, I'm going to try to be as clear as possible. Again, if there's any questions that come up, go ahead and, and shoot them out. And Sarah, thanks again for helping to, uh, to manage and coordinate that. Okay, um, so I'll say right here before we move on to the next slide that kind of these big buckets of integration level are really the, the design level, the methods level, and the interpretation, the reporting level. And as like a quick definition, when I think about the design level, I think about the, the order and the sequencing of quantitative and qualitative methods, right? what's the order in that sequence? The methods level, I really think about how do they actually integrate, right? And we'll talk about how that's categorized. Uh, and then the interpretation and reporting, that's more of a, a communication uh, and dissemination type of piece. Okay, so taking a deep, uh, deeper dive into the design level, 
the authors in this paper, they break it down into kind of basic designs that you see over here on the left side of your screen uh, and more advanced designs that you see over on the right side. Um, and we'll start off my uh, kind of giving uh, uh, definitions and examples of the basic designs, uh, exploratory sequential, explanatory sequential, uh, and convergent. Okay, so in the, let me move some of my things so I can see my own slides. Um, in the exploratory sequential framework, really simply and its basic definition is it's just outlining the order of qualitative to quantitative. So in this type of mixed methods framework of exploratory sequential, you start with the qualitative component first, and that moves on to the quantitative component. So the visual that you see here on this particular slide uh, is from a, an AJPH publication uh, on a project that I collaborated on with uh, Carol Runyon, Ashley Brooks Russell, uh, Sam Brand Spiegel, and Emmy Betts, um, looking at law enforcement and gun retailers as partners for uh, safely storing guns to prevent suicide. And this was a, a mixed methods project that was qualitative in, in on the front to quantitative. So the qualitative component was grounded theory-based investigation or interviews that were conducted with both law enforcement and gun retailers. And those were done to uh, explore the issue of gun storage and suicide prevention, explore their perceptions. That grounded theory qualitative component was conducted until thematic saturation. And that information was then used to design, develop, and then ultimately administer uh, a survey to get more quantitative measures of those perceptions and actual practices uh, that happen. Okay, so that's an illustrating example. This first basic framework, exploratory sequential is just qualitative to quantitative. Okay, our next basic framework is an explanatory sequential. And this just flips it from the previous framework, which is quantitative to qualitative. Uh, and the example that I've got listed here is a, a quasi-experimental study of nurse-family partnership um, for multiparous women. The visual that you see here is the uh, a slide from a presentation that I did at uh, APHA uh, a few months ago. Uh, and I'll try to move through this quickly. Uh, this slide is really from a pilot formative study that was conducted uh, looking at the delivery and the adaptation of the nurse family partnership, a nurse home visitation program to multiparous mothers or mothers that had previously given birth. Uh, historically, the NFP has been delivered to first time uh, mothers. And so Building upon this pilot formative study, this quasi-experimental study is partnering with a couple large health systems um, that are associated with some of the nurse family partnership sites. And it's um, taking advantage of their electronic medical record systems to operationalize quantitative program outcomes for the NFP. And then um, estimating quantitatively estimating program effects uh, of the nurse family partnership as delivered to multiparous women. So we're in the midst of that particular study right now. That particular component is obviously very quantitative. And then the qualitative component is, since we're partnering with those three sites, after we get our initial analysis done, we're planning a qualitative case study where we take those quantitative results, we actually take them back to those very sites uh, and do a sequence of um, interviews to inform a qualitative case study to gain context, a better understanding of those results and explore potential mechanisms of action that lead to the quantitative results uh, that we see. Okay. Uh, the next basic design here we have is convergent and this just kind of throws out the hard sequencing of quant qual or qual quant. Uh, and really the definition here is just simultaneous or iterative quantitative uh, and qualitative components. So they could be happening at the same time or they can be iterating together. Um, so the slightly less impressive visual that I have here is actually a screenshot from a report uh, from a project that I worked on with uh, Rich Lindrew, the collaborator in my own department and, and Sean O'Leary, who I'm sure some of you um, are familiar with here. And this was a project that we did in collaboration with the State Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, looking at um, state Medicaid innovations that were part of the state's accountable care collaborative, right? So the, the state's attempt to introduce innovations into the Medicaid system. And we took a very iterative approach. On the quantitative piece, we had kind of standard econometric 
cost and utilization measures that we were estimating from Medicaid claims data. And on the qualitative component, we had a grounded theory-based investigation with participating practices in the state's Medicaid program about how they were responding to the incentives and the new measures that were in there. Based on our quantitative results, that helped to inform some of our qualitative investigation to contextualize and understand those results. Based on feedback we heard from the practices, that actually informed subsequent quantitative analysis, especially around key performance indicators that were being um, used by the state. Um, I'll share one additional level of details. Very interesting to hear from the practices about which key performance indicators they felt really resonated with their practices versus which ones they thought um, didn't make sense. And that really helped us better understand some of the quantitative estimates and the results that we were seeing um, on those key performance indicators um, from those practices. Okay, so that's convergent, qualitative and quantitative happening simultaneously or actually iteratively. Okay, um, so taking a quick break, we've, we've just hit a major milestone, which is looking at the design level. We've kind of covered these basic mixed methods frameworks uh, exploratory sequential, explanatory sequential, and convergent. And so now we'll move on to uh, advanced frameworks, and we'll talk a little bit about multi-stage uh, intervention frameworks, case study, uh, and participatory. Okay. Um, for the advanced multi-stage, uh, I'm not going to walk through a specific example. I'm just going to give the definition. But this is basically just taking the basic frameworks that we talked about before, and it's building additional components onto it, right? So the authors in the paper, which I'm basing this presentation off of, they talked about multi -stage, a multi-stage advanced framework as having three or more sequential components, right? So it might be um, qual, quant, qual, or two or more convergent components all put together into a single project. And that's kind of multi-stage, just adding an additional stage on um, from the basic frameworks. Um, uh, and the next intervention framework, uh, the next advanced framework, excuse me, is an intervention. And the focus on this particular framework is intervention um, development and testing. And there's a, a little bit of um, flexibility that happens here, but maybe the easiest way for me to understand it and the way I'll explain it to you is that, you know, there is flexibility in terms of how the quantitative and qualitative components are really structured and ordered and integrated. But the focus of this particular framework is really on the intervention development and testing. And so a very common sequence of qualitative to quantitative uh, uh, methods here is that you have an initial qualitative component to inform intervention development. You then have a, a quantitative component that tests or estimate program effects, again, followed by an additional qualitative component to contextualize the findings, explore potential mechanisms of action, and basically have that explanatory component that flows from um, the quantitative component. Um, and, and I'll confess from the multi-stage in the intervention, I've, I've, I didn't have examples to pull from myself, so I'll just leave it at the, at the definitional phase. Uh, and given how time's progressing, I don't think I'll have time to give examples for everyone, but I'll, I'll sneak a few more examples here. Um, the, a next advanced framework is a case study framework. And so this is just when multiple quantitative and qualitative components triangulate to build a comprehensive case, right? So you use multiple qualitative and quantitative data elements to give a really complete nuanced and detailed understanding uh, of a particular case. And as an illustrative example, I'll go back to the study that I talked about before and this um, pilot or formative study looking at the adaptation and the delivery of the nurse family partnership um, to multiparous women. Uh, and I'm going to steal a slide from a presentation that I, I did a couple of months ago um, where I talked about the methods. I introduced the methods as first the framework to hold it all together. We're using a case study framework as an advanced mixed methods framework to hold these different qualitative and qualitative, uh, qualitative and quantitative components together to triangulate together uh, about what this pilot informative study saw and what we experienced. And the various sources of data that were included in this included descriptive statistics to characterize the program scale and scope. Um, we also included a grounded theory-based qualitative investigation that was focused on NFP nurse and other professionals um, experiences. And that information was gathered through interviews. We also included results from a survey of collaboration dynamics to see how the program worked with other key institutional partners in their settings. 
Uh, and that was also mixed with a grounded theory based quality, qualitative interviews with mothers uh, and also with the practice experience of, of uh, uh, pilot program implementers. So that's a lot of different data sources uh, and the case study framework is really flexible and, and allows you to mix all of those together. Um, and I'll come back and give you a specific example about results and themes that we concluded and how we used different types of data, both quantitative and qualitative to support those, uh, those conclusions uh, and results. Okay. Um, and the final advanced kind of design framework that I'll talk about here is participatory. Uh, and the definition here is just incorporating the voice and perspective of the focus population or community. So for some of you, that might sound a lot like community-based participatory research. Uh, and that's because I think community-based participatory research really falls into this category, but it's an even more flexible, broad um, framework that can encompass other types of participatory processes, not just community-based participatory research. Uh, and the illustrative example here um, is actually a paper uh, that I published with Nicole Hardy and, and Brett Friedman um, uh, titled Kids, Cops, and Community Qualitative Assessment of Police, Youth, and Parent Perceptions of Each Other. This came from a, a much larger participatory project that I and the School of Public Health engaged in with the Aurora Police Department, and that was generally around the objective of addressing um, youth and, and gang violence. And this was a very participatory process, and we had a stakeholder group that involved uh, community members, youth voice, parent voice, um, other community groups, and the police department itself, and that spread out. Um, I'm going to confess, I don't uh, identify as an expert in participatory process or community-based participatory process, although I was the PI in this particular project, and I found it ever-growing and ever-expanding and going off into all different kinds of uh, directions, and that included very quantitative types of analysis that were pushed by um, the advisory board or the, the overarching stakeholder group, and, um, and because of that guidance, we did um, very interesting geospatial based analysis with the police department's crime data. Um, we also applied for funding and um, um, provided funding for um, community based um, programming to try to uh, address the issue of youth and gang violence. And it also led to this um, kind of research slash practice piece. This effort was ultimately report um, published as a practice report. Um, and that was because of a push from the stakeholder group to better understand and have a more systematic approach to having uh, gathering perspectives that youth had about police and that police had about youth. And that was really informed by this perception that the entire discussion was just being infused by sensationalized anecdote. And they really wanted a more systematic assessment uh, of what happened. And so to be responsive, uh, to this project and true to the participatory uh, process, you know, we, we engaged uh, in that very effort and did a more systematic assessment of these, these perceptions from both the community and, uh, and the police end. Um, okay, so that was, that was a, a long convoluted uh, explanation of the project. Hopefully, hopefully it made sense. But that's my kind of experience with, um, um, with this type of advanced framework. Okay, so we'll take a, a quick deep breath. We just did a, like a whirlwind uh, tour through the design level. Um, and really when I think of design level, I think of uh, ordering and sequencing. It really lays out, okay, you've got distinct qualitative and you've got distinct quantitative components in your mixed methods project. How do they actually order? Like what comes first, what comes next? How, how does that, what does that actually look like? And we've already walked through kind of these three basic designs that have been put forward uh, and four more advanced designs. Uh, maybe I'll give us a quick mental break and, and step sideways here and say, um, in some of this, in some of this, and for those of you that have experience here, you might be seeing other frameworks or other mixed methods approaches to say, hey, you know, this um, convergent um, or case study but let's just say case study because the, the 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 term is the same. Case study just seems a lot like political science case studies, and 
um, you know, the flexibility of incorporating qualitative and quantitative, and, and I totally agree. And so um, this paper and what I'm presenting to you is not the only mixed methods framework that's out there. There are others, um, although I think this has lots of advantages and there's been effort put into here to make this really flexible and encompass um, other types of frameworks uh, that exist. Um, I'm sure there's, maybe there's a, a, a somebody who is sophisticated in, in uh, or is a sociologist and is thinking about grounded theory as a, at, used as a mixed methods framework and sees parallels between convergent designs and the iterative components of convergent designs and sees parallels with the iterative components of, of a, a grounded theory based framework. And, and I see those too. So, um, okay. So uh, back on the road, off the shoulder, uh, we'll move forward uh, from what we got here and move on from the design level, which again, really talks about the sequencing and the ordering and talk about methods, right? So, okay. And methods really gets to, once we've got that ordering and that sequencing and you've got both quali qualitative and quantitative components, what does that integration um, actually look like? And so in, in doing a deeper dive into that method level integration, we're gonna be talking about connecting, building, merging and embedding. And we're gonna have a parallel structure here. I'm gonna go through each, define them. Uh, and then I'm gonna uh, attempt when I've got a, a personal example to, to draw from, to give an illustrative, uh, an illustrative example. Okay. Uh, so the first one that we have is um, connecting, and this is really linkage of the qualitative and the quantitative data through the sampling frame, right? So the visual that we've got here, uh, this is just a description of a, of a study titled Aligning Health and Social Systems to Expand Evidence-Based Home Visiting. Uh, and uh, Accord's own uh, Mandy Allison and myself here are writing the uh, coattails of uh, Dr. Venice Williams on this particular project. And I think this is a great example of uh, a mixed methods project with connecting linkage of the quantitative and the qualitative components. So on the quantitative end, this project has a collaboration survey that's going out to quantitatively assess and measure collaboration dynamics uh, between nurse home visiting, in this case, NFP again, and a range of in key institutional partners in local communities. And then it's taking those quantitative results and it's identifying high performers, right? So this takes on lots of different terms. Some people call it um, the, 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 the curious name to me, positive deviancy approach, right? Or like a high performer approach. And it's taking that quantitative measure of collaboration, identifying those high performers, purposefully selecting them for the subsequent qualitative phase to understand what are the factors contributing and that allows them to have such strong collaboration dynamics and such strong uh, collaboration measures. Right, so connecting, that is one, uh, one of those linkages with the kind of explicit connection through, through the sampling frame. Okay, um, the next type of uh, kind of connecting element is building. And that really results when, or the definition of that is when one method informs the data collection of the subsequent method. And so now we're, we're going back to our friend, uh, the law enforcement and gun retailers uh, paper that was published in um, AJPH. And a re quick reminder that this was a mixed methods project of qualitative uh, leading into quantitative and the qualitative grounded theory based interviews and the results of those really helped to define the domains, helped to establish the questions, establish the terminology for the survey that was developed and ultimately administered to law enforcement and, uh, and gun shops and retailers uh, in, in the Mountain West. So that's the results from one, the results from the quantitative, really informing the data collection and even the instrument in this particular case uh, of the quantitative piece. So that's, that's really building here. Okay, and then merging, uh, is combining quali quantitative and qualitative data together um, for analysis and comparison. Uh, and now we're back to a, a different old friend, and this is the uh, pilot and informative study looking at the NFP as delivered to multiparous women. And remember all those different data sources that we had for this particular project. I promise that we'd come back to it. So I'm making good on my promise now. One of the things that we concluded uh, in this project was that multiparous mothers 
in this formative work were, were higher risk. They were high risk in general, the program is designed for high risk, but they were higher risk in comparison to primiparous or the first time mothers that were being served at the same sites, right? Um, let me go the other direction. And then the, the merging component of using both quantitative and qualitative to support this. I'll just give a quick example. Here's one of the quantitative components. Well, we're looking in the mental health domain and here you see we're presenting um, the percentage of mothers uh, that were um, screened to have depression or anxiety by various validated screeners. Um, you can see the depression numbers uh, on the left and the anxiety numbers on the right, so that's the quantitative component. Uh, and then the qualitative component that's being merged in here um, are interviews that we conducted, um, grounded theory-based interviews that we conducted. And here's one illustrative quote um, from a social worker who writes, some of our multips are dealing with homelessness or kids that are sick. It just weighs heavier on them because they have more babies to care for that they love and they wanna protect. And I think it just puts them at increased risk you know, for depression and anxiety. It just makes overall everything harder for them to care for. Um, so in my mind, this is a, um, a nice illustrated example of the merging approach, right? There's a conclusion that's there and there's both quantitative and qualitative data that's put forward to support a particular result or conclusion that's put forward. Okay, uh, so the next kind of method integration is embedding. Uh, and the definition here is just when data collection and analysis are linked at, at multiple points. So it, it's basically that additional level. It can combine connecting, building, and merging uh, at various points. And the authors of the paper stated that embedding is especially important uh, in intervention advanced designs. And, and you'll remember that the intervention advanced designs were really there for, with a focus on intervention development, and it frequently takes the form of qualitative to help inform and design the intervention, quantitative to estimate the, um, the intervention's impact, and then qualitative to then um, learn and explain and contextualize and help explore uh, particular mechanisms of action. And so I think this embedding just recognizes that there might be multiple types of integration as you go through the, those multiple kinds uh, of steps. Okay, so we're, we're making, well, we're actually kind of right on time here and we've hit, hit another milestone. So we've been through both the design level of some of these frameworks and the methods level. And so you could see how these fit together and can um, help explain and give clarity to what are sometimes very complicated uh, mixed methods designs. So if we've got an iterative design, you can let people know, well, there's a convergent element to it. And uh, if there's this, it's a convergent design and you see that there's kind of merging elements in it, you could say there is a, it's a convergent de design with merging elements to the quantitative and qualitative piece. Or it's an explanatory sequential with connecting elements that are there. And that just provides a framework and that gives clarity for reviewers, other researchers, your readers of your research to kind of understand how that, that all fits together. Um, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge forward into interpretation uh, and reporting, and that kind of gets to this dissemination uh, and reporting element. And I'll go through there. Sarah, I, I let myself become distracted and I peeked and I see there are some chats. Is there anything uh, that we should address now? I think we can go ahead and hold till the end. Okay, okay, awesome, thank you. Um, Okay, so in terms of interpretation and reporting, um, it's kind of like three things to touch on. One is uh, the narrative, and the narrative is broken down into weaving, continuous, and staged reporting. There's also data transformation, which I'll confess I think might belong in a different category, but we'll talk about what the authors uh, mean by this. And then also joint displays in terms of uh, creating a visual that represents both qualitative and quantitative um, elements. So when we think of uh, narrative, I'm, I'm really thinking about how you're writing up and disseminating, disseminating your results. Uh, and the authors in this paper, I think, do a nice job and break it down into these kind of three basic components. In weaving, you're just reporting quantitative and qualitative results together by a theme or concept. Right? 
in continuous, you're reporting quantitative and qualitative results in the same paper, but they're in distinct sections. So they're, they're separate. Um, so the earlier example that I have for you before in the um, case study presentation of some of the results from the NFP multiparous pilot, I would say that's a very much of a, a weaving approach where we're putting forward themes and then we're presenting quantitative and qualitative data within a given theme to support that. In a continuous approach, uh, you're splitting out the quantitative and qualitative elements, but they might, but they're still going to appear in the same paper or report, but they have their distinct sections. And then very commonly, and including very commonly with me, even though I, I conduct uh, a lot of mixed methods work, um, when it comes to dissemination, uh, it's very common to see a staged type of approach. And really, this is the familiar uh, practice of what we see is uh, reporting qualitative and quantitative results separately uh, in their own paper or report. And then sometimes you see really interesting, well-designed, and I'm guilty of this too, really interesting and well-designed mixed methods projects. But because of practical considerations, including um, uh, word limits uh, of journals, what you see in the dissemination is you see very distinct kind of quantitative and qualitative papers that come out that are separate from one another uh, and sometimes don't even fully kind of embrace, reveal, divulge the, the mixed methods nature uh, of the uh, original, uh, original projects. Um, um, the next thing that I'll talk about in this kind of general uh, reporting category is, is data transformation. And, and I'll confess, if I was given a draft of this paper by the authors that this uh, talk is, is based off of what I'm presenting to you, I might have suggested putting data transformation uh, up into the method, because really it gets to this heart of how qualitative and quantitative integrate and interface with one another. And when um, the authors talk here about data transformation, they're just talking about when one type of data is converted to another type of data. Um, and the example that immediately came to mind in my own research portfolio was uh, this project that, that we published a paper on uh, in American Journal of uh, Preventative Medicine. Uh, and in this project, we looked at uh, ignition interlock laws. And um, this paper really focuses on quantitatively estimating um, the association or the impact on those laws on fatal motor vehicle crashes from the fatal, from NHTSA's fatal analysis reporting system. But if you look, if you look closely at the author list, you'll note that a couple of the authors are, are lawyers, uh, are also lawyers. Uh, and so this was really a mixed methods project. It was really qualitative to quantitative with data transformation. And the qualitative piece was 50 state legal analysis around ignition interlock laws. And each state had uh, kind of their legal analysis that happened through time. Um, and that was written up by the public health lawyers that collaborated with us on this project. After that 50 state legal analysis was completed, we then created a coding scheme to identify what were key components of laws and, and uniform or similar components of laws uh, across the 50 states. We applied that coding scheme to that legal analysis. We quantified that data. We then paired that quantified data uh, with the um, fatal analysis reporting system, which gives us uh, quantitative indicators of uh, fatal motor vehicle crashes during that same time period. Uh, and then uh, in this particular case, ran both uh, um, time series analysis as well as um, more of a panel-based uh, random effects uh, panel analysis to estimate the quantitative impacts of key components that were really drawn from that qualitative legal analysis uh, that was there. <clears throat> and I don't have the exact numbers memorized, but I'll spoil the surprise. We, we did find an association between more stringent ignition interlock laws and requirements uh, and decreased alcohol-related fatal motor vehicle crashes um, through time uh, in the United States. So that's, that's the data transformation piece. Uh, and I'll end here with, um, with joint displays. And this is just a... Um, way of disseminating and communicating visually uh, both quantitative and qualitative results in a single display. And really the, the intent here is to, um, like any good visual, to um, serve as an information shortcut. And by putting both quantitative and qualitative data together, 
maybe creating an opportunity or a vehicle to gain additional insights into um, uh, the results or the, the implications of those projects and, and what might be coming out of that, that interplay between the quantitative uh, and the qualitative components. And here you just see uh, an example. I won't um, uh, get into too much detail here. Uh, so I have some finishing thoughts that'll just take me a minute or two, and then maybe we'll have a little bit of time to address um, some of the questions as they come up. Okay. Perfect. Um, the, the, one of the things that I'll touch on is that the authors in this paper, paper, I thought, put forward something really interesting, which is also kind of a categorization or framework of thinking about reconciling the results from mixed methods work. And they really talk about them in three general buckets. Confirmation, right? That's when the, the quantitative results and the quali qualitative results really confirm or make sense or reinforce one another. Um, they also talk about expansion, right? So maybe there's not this perfect confirmation, but there, it, in some way, both the quantitative and the qualitative results can provide new insights or you realize something new or a nuance or an expansion uh, into something new. Um, Boy, I'm tempted to give you an example. I'm gonna bite my tongue and we'll just, we'll leave it at that. Um, and discordance, uh, which is the results uh, contradict one another or they might not be what you expect. Uh, and, and I'll confess, when I think of discordance, I think, is that really expansion that you just haven't gotten to yet, right? So if you've got inconsistent results, is it that something's wrong or there's some inconsistency or there's some uh, validity issues and measurement or something like that? That's possible, but given all the work and the energy that you've put in to have good, reliable, valid results and analysis for both the quantitative and qualitative piece, and you've got confidence in those results, why might you be seeing what you initially perceive as some discordance? Maybe there's some kind of expansion component or a nuance in those results, and it helps to broaden your understanding of whatever it is you might be investigating. Okay, last, last slide, I promise or actually there's maybe one after this, but that's just like a landing pad. So uh, final thoughts, um, and, and I've already mentioned this, there are other mixed methods um, frameworks and actually even before discovering and reading this paper, there were other things that I used as mixed methods frameworks, including the uh, case study methods. And I used case studies uh, as a framework. I've used the grounded theory and the iterative um, abductive reasoning components of, of grounded theory as a mixed methods framework as well. I also wanna emphasize again that uh, a framework, uh, it's not a method. You still need to be very specific about both your quantitative and qualitative methods. So if you say I'm doing a um, sequential uh, exploratory design quant to qual, well, what is that qual? Are you doing a grounded theory-based approach where you're mining the perspective of different entities? Are you doing a case study approach where you, you are getting multiple perspective, but it's really around one single thing? right? Like a state's program or a policy, or are you looking at something totally different, maybe taking qualitatively a phenomenological approach and looking at patient experience, right? Where you don't want to impose any beliefs onto how people are perceiving and interpreting their own type of experience, but you really want to understand the contextual elements and how their background really forms into their understanding and their interpretation. Um, so that's still really uh, important to do. Um, uh, and I've said this a couple times, but maybe it's great to end on this too, um, that these mixed methods frameworks that can really help to bring additional clarity to sometimes complicated mixed methods research and proposals. And I found myself even in write-ups being able to use these kind of frameworks and have that be a, an information shortcut and have that to more succinctly and clearly communicate to reviewers, readers, whoever the audience might be exactly how the mixed methods project um, was, was structured, what integration elements were there in terms of the qualitative and the quantitative components. Um, and that um, I think is useful both from a dissemination, actually just clarity in terms of execution when you're conducting the research itself. And I think that's also useful at the proposal phase because that can that information shortcut will also be useful for reviewers uh, as well. Okay. Um, that's all I've got planned, uh, Sarah, uh, and everybody else. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for your time. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Greg.
I, I want to point out a few things as we move into Q&A. Um, there's a, an evaluation link in the chat. We really want to hear from all of you about what you think about our, our seminar. So please take a few minutes to fill out that very short eval for us. And Greg, as we have gone through this talk, um, we've gotten a lot of questions in the chat about choosing your mixed methods framework. How do you know which one to use? Does it matter? Um, what kind of question you have? Um, and so the other sort of more nuanced version of that that came up was, does that change if I have secondary data that I'm using? So can you maybe think, uh, talk a little bit about how you think about choosing the framework yeah. that you use for your mixed methods research? Yeah, so I, I think, so this is a great question. And one of the reasons why um, I became and took, went down the path of becoming a mixed methods researcher was because I, I felt like I was very question driven in the research questions that I had. And sometimes those questions really lent themselves better to quantitative approaches, but, but sometimes those questions lent themselves to qualitative approaches. And in, in my own mind, um, the right sequencing and how to design a mixed methods project, that's how I approach it as well. It's very question driven, right? And so um, let me give, so one of the examples that I gave as an illustrative example is uh, that project that I worked on with Rich Lindruth and Sean O'Leary, where we worked with uh, the State Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing to evaluate and look at their um, innovations that they'd introduced into the state's Medicaid program as part of the Accountable Care Collaborative 1.0, and they've since moved on to 2.0. Maybe we're even on three. I don't think we're on 3.0 yet, but I think we're still on 2.0. Um, and our mixed methods approach and that iterative approach that we had to looking at both quantitative outcomes from the claims data and the qualitative data from the practices really came about from the underlying question that motivated the whole project. So, which was, it was multifaceted, right? It doesn't fit into one question. It was, okay, as a, as a state, when we introduced these innovations, what was the intent? Well, the intent was we wanted to improve quality. So we improved, we included quality indicators in our analysis. We wanted to control costs and optimize utilization. And then the state in their Accountable Care Collaborative 1.0, I don't want to get into too much, too much detail, but instead of dictating a type of approach that practices or, um, or, or uh, hospitals or you know, providers across the state should do, they actually left that very much wide open. And they said, do whatever you want, whatever you think is best, but here are the key indicators that you're going to be measured on. And however you want to get there, you can do it. And so another question was, how are they doing on those indicators? But then because the state had left it really open, they wanted to know how the practices were actually adapting. How were they actually changing? What were they doing? So some of those questions in terms of, okay, what does it look like in terms of cost? What does it look like in terms of utilization? What does it look like in terms of the performance on the key performance indicators? That really lends itself to a quantitative approach. And for that project, we had access to um, Medicaid claims data, and so we were able to kind of hit it with the standard uh, econometric tools that are there and did cost utilization and looked at key performance indicators. But then that qualitative piece was also very interesting of looking at, you know, interviewing the practices and hearing their perspectives about these incentives, which ones really resonated with them, which ones didn't, and what kind of practice changes, what kind of practice transformation, you know, was happening. And it, that was fascinating. We heard things all across the board. We heard about certain practices really resonating with certain key performance indicators and then just ignoring others and deciding that they were gonna focus on certain key performance indicators like effective diabetes treatment. And you know what, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna structure our practice transformation and care coordination around these types of key performance indicators. And we're gonna focus on particular diseases and those types of things. Um, and we've got dedicated care coordinators that are there that are cherry picking those patients that we think we need to focus on. And then other, I'll stop to re it really in just a second here, but other practices taking not so much of a targeted approach, but having 
a broader practice transformation and moving to kind of care teams and care pods and moving away from the physician-centric care delivery model. Uh, and in those types of practices, you know, what really resonated with them in terms of their key performance indicators. And knowing that, that information got fed back and gave us a clearer understanding of the variability that we were seeing in key performance indicator performance. Um, okay, I think I answered, hopefully I answered at least or partially addressed at least one of the questions that you put forward. And, and maybe I'll go back to that and I remember it now. It's like, which one do you decide? And, and I think you don't want the tail wagging the dog in my mind. I think you start off with what is your interest? What is your research question? And then you put some thought into what is the sequence of quantitative and qualitative approaches that's really gonna help address this research question. And then even, I'll be honest, even before I think about a particular framework, I, I think about it from a what's best to address the research question perspective. And then I take a step back and I think, okay, okay, this makes sense. It's quantitative to qualitative, right? And so that's gonna be um, uh, an explanatory sequential type of approach and how are they actually fitting together? You know, then I walk down that line and that helps to give structure and communicate more easily what the study design is. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Another, another question that's come up uh, a couple different ways is thinking about advice for reporting on mixed methods in the health services research context. Um, so both broadly, um, and you pointed out a few differences in sort of weaving contiguous and, and staged reporting, um, but also in thinking about justifying the rigor of both sides of your data um, in these kinds of designs. Yeah, I, I, this is something that I'm still learning. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and the truth of that statement is we're all still learning, right? We wanna have the, the growth mindset. That's why we're, we're, we're in academics. Um, and I feel like this is um, something that the field struggles with. And I, I talked about how um, in, in reporting and writing papers, you so frequently see a stage type of approach, which like really elegantly integrated mixed methods projects will get broken out into a quantitative paper and a qualitative paper. And I think that's pragmatic sometimes. Um, and also from a from a submitting your paper to uh, a journal. I mean, we're all familiar with, you know, you know, at the most selective journals, we're looking at under 3000 words, right? That can go in there. That's barely enough to um, just cover one method. You think about, um, you, you think about even journals that, uh, that allow more space, like I think of, um, and, and that are very more mixed methods and qualitatively oriented like social science and medicine, I think it's like 8,000 words. I find it hard just to get in a really comprehensive qualitative paper in that type of, of word limit sometimes. So it's, so it's, it's it is really challenging. Um, and I don't have the, the perfect solution. Um, and I'm kind of learning as I go. But one of the illustrative examples that I put forward was that, that qualitative, um, or I'm sorry, the case study uh, approach to the um, nurse family partnership pilot and formative work around uh, uh, delivering the program to multiparous women. And I'm in the midst of writing that as a true mixed methods case where in the paper, I'm putting forward the themes and then putting quantitative and qualitative results in those themes um, that are there. Uh, but I, I'll confess, I, str I struggle with that as well. And again, that's, I think, in response to just the, the practical constraints of what it takes to get um, things submitted and published. Sarah, did I answer the question? I think so. Okay. Um, and then just a really quick question before we uh, wrap up. Um, yeah. We have a couple of people asking about open-ended questions in surveys and how you might categorize that as mixed methods or not. Um, yeah. And maybe any advice you have around that? Yeah. So I think open ended questions uh, in surveys. Uh, so I'll, I'll confess something maybe. So when I think of surveys, I think about typically quantifying something, right? And then that open ended question, it's like a, it's like a qualitative data component that, that's there. It's kind of like a prepackaged mixed methods project that's already there. Um, and, and I would say that that 
And because that data is qualitative, right? It's really open. It's not, you know, adhering to some Likert scale that you put in there. It's really open to what kind of, uh, it, it's a different type of analysis that's necessary to really uh, make sense of that particular data. Um, and, and really, again, depending on the nature of it, I think it can lend itself to different types of qualitative methods. And there are um, interesting examples of people that have taken uh, textual types of analysis uh, that have been applied to open response for surveys. You see the same types of things in terms of textual analysis that happens um, for like social media postings or other types of things. Really interesting, both textual and visual analysis that's been done with advertising. You've seen this in like tobacco and, and the vaping world in terms of um, looking at target populations uh, and, and messaging um, from industry. Uh, again, Sarah, have I answered the question? So I, I think that's interesting data. And I think the open response in a survey, in my mind, that's more qualitative in nature than the rest of the survey piece. And that requires a different method, a different type of approach. Which one exactly, I think, depends on um, depends on other specifics of the project. Thank you, Greg, for uh, a wonderful overview of mixed methods frameworks and approaches. Um, I want to thank all of the rest of you for joining us uh, and uh, for Greg's talk and for your great questions. Um, again, there's an evaluation link in the chat um, and we hope you'll give us your feedback. And thank you all and we'll see you at our next, uh, next seminar on February 16th. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.